This is the story of how high street banks can lure their customers into debt. It's told by a powerful insider. In all my years of experience in the banking industry, I would say that consumers should be very, very wary of their banks. They put profits before the customer at every given opportunity. It's the story of how banks routinely encourage customers to borrow more than they can afford. Sometimes with fatal consequences. They told me we'd been found on the railway line in the morning. I can't even I can't even begin to describe how I felt. You know, I had my children to deal with and I had to tell this family and it's like the world just stopped. As long as the car are not running. The bank with the biggest slice of our credit card business doesn't want to talk about debt suicide. But this top executive from one of the biggest financial institutions in the UK is prepared to speak out. I am a senior executive working in the banking and credit card industry and I have decided to blow the whistle on this industry. Late at night in January last year, a body lies by a railway line. The only clue to the death is a bag nearby. Inside, dozens of credit card statements detailing a mountain of debt. Mark MacDonald, who was 43, had thrown himself under a train, leaving a widow and two children. Mark was one of at least 17 debt-related suicides across Britain in the last three years. His story was first highlighted a month ago by our colleagues on Britain's Streets of Debt. Now Panorama has fresh revelations about the lending practices of the high street banks. These tragic cases where people have taken their own lives are the cost that is paid for irresponsible lending practices and this is exactly why they need to be curbed. These suicides have been an inconvenience to the industry as a whole and they have exposed the practices that the banking industry have got away with for years and years and years. Those are the words of someone who knows. She's a senior executive who works here in the very heart of the banking world in the city of London. And she's the first high-ranking whistleblower, prepared, in fact, she felt compelled to break the bank's code of silence and reveal the industry's inner workings. Today, she tells us how the high street banks precisely target customers for borrowing and how they profit from those in financial difficulty. I cannot overemphasize the focus on profits. And it simply gets to the point where when you see real life cases of people who are really suffering or who lose a loved one, when you just, just can't take it anymore. By speaking out, our top banking executive has risked her livelihood and career because she signed an agreement never to disclose publicly details of the bank's lending strategy. In order to protect her, we've agreed to disguise her, and her words are spoken by an actor. My experience is with the big banks in this country, the high street banks that 80% of us bank with. I don't think any bank, once its internal procedures exposed, um, maybe the reason for that is that some of them are quite questionable. The banking industry is a giant machine that pushes borrowing and makes enormous profits. Staff tend not to be paid particularly well. Every branch of any bank and every individual who works in a bank has very ambitious sales targets. To sell you more products, 
effectively to make you borrow money and to get you into further debt. They will have targets on every product that is available through the branch and they will have commissions or bonuses on every product. It's a very, very sophisticated, tailored, tested marketing strategy and sales pitch to a public that have very little knowledge of what's going on. Effectively though, the most profitable customers are perhaps the most vulnerable. Customers like Mark McDonald, who stepped in front of that train one night late last January. It was midday the next day, and they came and told me that they found him. They told me he'd been found on the railway line in the morning. He'd left the backpack at the side of the railway track, and he, he was full of bills, credit card bills, loans, all the, the evidence of the debt. To the industry, Mark was a revolver. Someone who borrows heavily, makes minimum payments, and never fully repays their debts. The revolvers are the customers who borrow money month in, month out. They're the people who are paying very high interest charges. They're the people who are likely to pay extra fees when they go over their credit limit. They're the people most likely to um, pay penalty charges. So you want to retain these customers at all costs. Mark had been a revolver for years. He lived in Downham Market in Norfolk, where he worked as a writer of technical manuals. His wife Marion had given up work to have two children. The family relied on his income of roughly £26,000 a year, and they struggled. He would occasionally say things like, we can't afford that this month. And, and he would say, you know, I've got the gas bill and the phone bill to pay. And I'd say, OK, well, you know, we'll wait, we'll do that next month. In the space of 10 years, Mark had acquired eight credit cards, two of which were issued by his own bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And he owed thousands of pounds on them. He survived by just paying the minimum charge each month. People who have traditionally made the minimum payments, people who are heavy borrowers, people whose um, repayments are not even covering the interest, um, never mind the capital that is outstanding on the card, they are the ideal credit card customer. That is the perfect customer, the ones that makes you the most profit. And let's face it, it's an industry that focuses on profit. RBS knew exactly what Mark's income was. It knew he was making only minimum repayments on the money he owed. Yet his credit limits on both cards were increased several times. One was upgraded to platinum, which eventually had a credit limit of over £12,000. In the last 12 months of Mark's life, the bank made over £3,000 in interest and charges on the two cards. He considered credit cards to have a status, always had, always had a, um, you know, the fact that he, he, he could have a card with his name on it. And I think the idea of paying for something with a platinum card seemed to say to him that, um, he, you know, he, he was respected and the bank respected him. The platinum card says you've got a lot of prestige and a lot of money and, and he, it wasn't true. It was just like a sham, really. It is generally felt that in the industry, by increasing the customer's credit limit, by upgrading their card to gold or platinum, you are increasing customer loyalty and hitting those marketing targets of retaining profitable customers. Marion only discovered how much Mark owed after his death. He just said he'd got into debt with credit cards. 
I mean, I knew he had credit cards, so I presumed that was it. It's only looking through finance now that I found out that he also had overdrafts and loans with the bank and loan companies. Despite his £26,000 income, RBS lent Mark huge sums. It allowed him to build up a £6,000 overdraft. The bank lent him £15,000 to pay off his other lender's credit card debts. It let him remortgage his and Marion's home to the tune of £80,000. And it didn't end there. By the time he took his own life, Mark owed his bank almost £120,000. I can remember when I was quite a bit younger and I wanted to buy my first car. I had to sit in front of my bank manager and explain exactly how much the car was going to cost, how much I could afford, what my other outgoings were. But I think now, because it's offered, I think people somehow think if they're offered that amount of money, therefore they can afford it. We showed the whistleblower Mark's financial records. There were a number of warning signs from a relatively early stage that the bank should have picked up on. Here was a man on a very modest income. He was roughly earning £26,000 a year. He was lent his annual take-home pay just on credit cards, on two credit cards. He was making minimum payments on the cards for years. He wrote credit card checks from one of his RBS cards on a regular basis at exorbitant rates of interest and deposited them into his RBS bank account. The fact that he was overdrawn on his bank account, there are so many things the bank should have picked up on. There is no possible justification for the bank not to have understood that there were serious difficulties in this man's financial position. In my opinion, the bank was grossly irresponsible. The Royal Bank of Scotland knew exactly what his bank details were. They, they knew how much he earned, they knew what he was paying out every month. They, they knew the sort of balance in his account. I can't understand why they would just keep letting him have more and more money. The banks are basically neglecting their duty of care. They're putting profits before human life, almost. In circumstances like Mark McDonald's, where there has been clear irresponsible lending, in my opinion, there should be laws introduced where banks can be prosecuted. This is how serious I believe this is. In a statement last month, the Royal Bank of Scotland said, Throughout Mr McDonald's time with RBS, we dealt with him in a responsive and professional manner. He had a regular dialogue with his personal banking manager, and the lending decisions on his account were consistently based on strict lending criteria. Mr. McDonald managed his current account and maintained regular payments to both of his credit card accounts. He did not exceed his credit limit. The bank's records show that at no time did Mr. McDonald make contact with the bank to inform us that he was in financial difficulty. That statement is seriously misleading. The bank says that Mark McDonald didn't tell them he was in financial difficulty. But the fact is, the bank knew. We've seen an internal RBS document which makes it clear that Mark's branch was aware of what it refers to, and I quote, as his financial difficulties. We've tried repeatedly to get an interview with RBS about their consumer lending decisions, but they've turned down all our requests. So I'm heading off to the global headquarters of RBS, just outside Edinburgh, to see if I can have a word with the chief executive, Sir Fred Goodwin. With profits for 2005 of eight billion pounds and a gleaming modern headquarters, RBS are certainly in no financial difficulty. Come on, get out. Hi there. So 
sorry to bother you. I'm from BBC Panorama. Um, we're hoping to have a word with the uh, chief executive, Sir Fred Goodwin. What well, is it? Is that... expect, what did you expect? What do you want me to do just now, then, over? The high street banks are constantly adjusting their financial strategy and launching new lending products. It's a fiercely competitive market, servicing a UK debt burden currently running at over a trillion pounds. Is that turned off? Excuse me, is that camera turned off? Otherwise, you'll have to get the police in. We'll get the, the marketing department is the engine of the business and it will have a whole series of targets. Um, it will have targets to attract new customers, um, which are extremely ambitious. And then you have um, you have very aggressive targets to maximise profits on existing customers. Monthly sales targets and meetings are what the marketing department lives for. Credit cards are banks' biggest and most profitable consumer lending product especially when we can be persuaded to increase our spending and to carry debt over from month to month. What one needs to be aware of is the fact that a credit card company has the ability to communicate with its customers once a month. So, therefore, there is the ability to really target those customers to ensure you're getting maximum profitability. However sad it is that people get into debt, and however much the banks may encourage it, surely it's people's own fault. They're responsible. The individual always has a responsibility to make sure that they are not borrowing beyond their means, and that they are able to repay uh, whatever unsecured lending they take on. The banks have other techniques to get you to borrow more from them. Robert Jenkins is another revolver. He's married to Evelyn, and they have five children in their teens. He's a school caretaker, and he earns £18,000 a year. We lived uh, very much hand to mouth. We um, had to budget carefully. Major bills, unexpected bills were... Uh, a problem for us. Robert's take-home pay was £250 a week, while Evelyn earned £100 a week in a part-time catering job. For years, they were getting by, just. But in the eyes of their bank, Robert and Evelyn needed some financial help. Robert was called in for a meeting. He remembers this as a financial health check, but Lloyd's TSB disputes this. We received a telephone call uh, inviting us along to the bank for a health check, uh, which seemed a good idea. When you're conducting a health check, you will look at areas where that person doesn't have perhaps one of the bank's products. They don't have a credit card, they don't have a loan, and in most cases they probably don't need it. But if they don't have it, you're going to try and sell it to them. Robert and Evelyn left the bank happy. They had a restructured mortgage deal, and within a few months, Robert had a platinum card with a £6,000 credit limit. It was a good feeling to know that you'd, you know, you'd, you'd got this sort of period of uh, austerity behind you. Your finances were on track, and they were so on track that you were creditworthy, not just for a few hundred pounds, but for a few thousand pounds. And that made me feel very good. This week, the credit card celebrated its 40th birthday. Today, there are over a thousand different cards available. And what you may not realize is that 70% of them are owned by the big five high street banks. At any one time, a single credit card will have up to a hundred different interest rates for purchases, introductory offers and cash. Armed with his new platinum card, Robert started to spend, spend, spend. If, uh, for example, I, I went to the garage, whereas before I would have had 
perhaps 10 or 20 pounds in my wallet uh, to use for, for petrol, I would fill up uh, with a credit card and I would think, you know, that, that was a, a sensible thing to do. I'll pay it off at the end of the month. But of course I didn't. Before long, you get to the stage where suddenly you haven't got that any credit left on your card. Um, and at that point, or thereabouts, the bank would step in and, and invite you to increase your credit limit. Unsolicited increases in your credit limit can um, take place up to twice a year. In some cases, your credit limit could literally double in the space of two years. The customer doesn't really have a say in it. The higher your credit limit, the more you're likely to spend. Robert started with £6,000 of credit on his platinum card. Within two years, the bank bumped up that figure to £11,000. Then Lloyd's TSB gave Evelyn a platinum card. Her credit limit, £4,500. Robert was tempted by other offers that came through the letterbox. You know what it is? Oh, yeah. Overall cost for comparison, 7.8% APR. It seemed to indicate to us that we, we were a much sought-after commodity uh, and that we were, were creditworthy, which made you feel good, you know. You, you feel quite important when they take such an interest in you. Some companies will send maybe 20 packs of direct mail to one individual, so it's bombarding someone with um, an unsolicited application to borrow large sums of money without necessarily knowing whether they have the ability to repay the debt. By now, the Jenkins had four new cards. I was horrified to find that we'd got a, a total debt of about £29,000 with credit cards and uh, I was absolutely gobsmacked. It had taken less than three years for the Jenkins family to reach a debt crisis. We've been meeting the minimum payments, but even they added up to somewhere in the region of about six or seven hundred pounds a, a month, um, just to, to keep the credit card companies off your back. It was almost half of my monthly income was being used to service the, the credit card debts. I woke up about five o'clock in the morning and it suddenly dawned on me that I'd put the house at risk um, and the problems that bankruptcy would incur and suddenly, you know, I, I really started to suffer a panic attack. My stomach started to churn, I, I began to suffer a cold sweat, and I, I curled up in a, a ball, you know, and I thought, how do I, how do I get out of this? You know, why, why has it happened? Why have I let it happen? And I felt guilty, and I felt all the, the, the emotions associated with, with sheer terror. This is Trowbridge, Wiltshire. In January 2005, a local mechanic killed himself with the exhaust fumes from his car. The reasons people take their own lives are complex. What's clear is that 65-year-old Richard Cullen died with over a hundred thousand pounds of credit card debt. At the end of this garden was Richard's workshop and garage. And that's where he was found, in the car, in the morning, about ten o'clock in the morning. He'd come back overnight sometime. My, my son found his car down the bottom and we called the police and he was in the garage. Richard and Wendy were married for 18 years. They had eight children from previous marriages. Richard earned roughly £15,000 a year and was another revolver, someone who borrowed heavily and never repaid the debt. It was really about two to three months before he died. The telephone was ringing almost sort of maybe 17, 18 times a day sometimes asking to speak to him. And I used to say, and, and they would say it was the, the bank or the credit card. And um, 
and I'd just give him the message, or if he was in the garden, I would go and give him the phone. And then he started to walk off with the phone. And I, I said, eventually, I th I th why, why are they calling so often? You must be in trouble. And just before Christmas, he admitted that he was terribly in debt. These are some of the statements I've discovered since Richard died. He owed roughly £135,000 on 22 credit cards. It's absolutely unbelievable. Shocking. Several lenders had issued more than one credit card to Richard Cullen. The market leader, the Royal Bank of Scotland Group, lent him over £35,000. They had issued him with four cards under different brand names, Mint, Tesco Personal Finance and two NatWest cards, which together generated the RBS Group over £4,000 in interest and charges in the last 12 months of Richard's life. We took the statements to the whistleblower. This is one of the worst cases of irresponsible lending that I have ever seen. Customers like Richard Cullen, they are the ideal customer. They hold multiple brands with one institution. In this case, credit cards are pushed all the way to the limit. Throughout his whole payment history, he's only making minimum repayments. He takes cash out. There are no interest-free periods. This is your perfect customer. He spends on the card every single month. He's a regular user. He was earning a very modest income of £15,000. The bank knows that they lent him £35,000. If that's not an alarm bell, then what is? There is an inconsistency in these statements in that there are credit limit increases at the same time as we're seeing a history of arrears and minimum repayments. It's, it's completely inconsistent. This is just a very, very good example of why the banks cannot be trusted to self-regulate. Why do they do it? Because they know they can get away with it. I'm angry at Richard and I'm angry at the banks. Richard had a responsibility. He took out the credit cards and the loans. But surely the bank must take responsibility as well for allowing him to go on and on getting deeper and deeper into debt. Several months after Richard's death, RBS agreed to write off his outstanding debt of £35,000. It's a very, very different life now. One day you're happy, the next day... ..it's nothing. You're just on your own. RBS told Panorama they were not aware that Mr. Cullen had a serious debt problem and hadn't made any errors in handling him or his accounts. We took our evidence to the man responsible for policing the banking code of practice. Hello. Hi. Mr. Fortescue, let me show you these. 5th of November 2004, Richard Cullen is being chased for arrears on his Mint card, which is operated by the Royal Bank of Scotland. Two weeks later, his credit limit has been increased on his Tesco Personal Finance card to £7,700. Tesco Personal Finance card also run by the Royal Bank of Scotland. The letters have been sent from the same address, the same P.O. box even. Isn't that a clear violation of the banking code. Well, I, I find it extraordinary that this has happened. I think it's a case of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. There's no excuse for that. But it was clearly very strange indeed for them to be increasing um, his card limit with on the one side and the other side trying to ask for their money back. This is within one bank. This is inexcusable, surely. I, I, I agree. I think this is, um, this is wrong. I will investigate to see whether there's been a breach of the banking code. Uh, we will need Mrs. Cullen's um, authority to do that, but I will gladly do that. In Norfolk, 
Mark McDonald's widow remains angry with RBS. Despite the circumstances of his death, the bank chose to pursue his estate for the money he owed them. After my husband's death, I received letters from them basically saying he owed them money and implying that I should, I should pay it. They, they wanted their money. Every major bank will have what they call a special recovery unit or a debt collection department. And the job of that department is to recover repayments from those people who have fallen into arrears. At the end of the day, if they don't recover that debt, the bank will have to write it off. So they have extremely aggressive targets, and this is why such aggressive tactics are employed to ensure the bank recovers its money at almost any cost. Mark McDonald's insurance policies had enabled RBS to recover over £90,000, but it still wanted full payment of its remaining £27,000, when other creditors were prepared to settle for a percentage of the money he owed. There have been many other similar cases where the banks, including the Royal Bank of Scotland, have chosen to write off the debt. In the case of Mark MacDonald, the Royal Bank of Scotland chose to pursue his estate. This is an obvious case of irresponsible lending, so I'm very surprised. I'm shocked. It was a slow process. A year after Mark's death, the bank still wouldn't agree to a compromise settlement. It's still a millstone around my neck, basically. If I have to pay it, I have to pay it, but I just want it to be gone. And it's not. I'm constantly having to, to be um, brought back to the situation. Six months ago, the Jenkins started to sort out their financial problems and to clear the £29,000 owing on their credit cards. They turned to National Debt Line, a charity that helps people in crisis. They now have a repayment plan. Any interest is frozen, but they still have to pay their creditors £180 a month out of their modest take-home pay. Don't run away, it's nearly time. Looking back, Robert accepts that he was financially naive, but he also feels his bank was equally responsible for lending him more than he could afford. I spent the money, that was my responsibility, but I seemed to be doing it with their agreement, so that's how it went. There's something immoral about the way that um, the banks are doing their business these days. They're making it far too easy for people to get into debt, and that's irresponsible. You should be able to trust your bank. You should be able to believe that you're a valued customer and not a, a means of uh, deriving a, a higher profit margin. In a statement, Lloyd's TSB said, We've made considerable efforts to help the Jenkins address their financial problems. By consolidating their external debts and remortgaging with us, we were able to reduce their outgoings by around £400 a month. We suspended all interests on their credit cards and overdraft and agreed their request for a three-month mortgage repayment holiday. We have tried to contact the couple to discuss how we might offer them further assistance. However, they've chosen not to take us up on our offer. The consequences of Britain's borrowing crisis are so serious that they're now hitting the banks themselves. They're facing a mountain of bad personal debt. So four of the high street banks, including Lloyd's TSB and RBS, have launched an initiative to identify customers in trouble. They'll now share information on clients' income, as well as their credit history, to inform their lending decisions. It is certainly a step in the right direction, but I do remain very skeptical. I 
I really believe the banks have had all along the information they need to to make decisions about whether individuals were at risk of falling into dangerous debt levels. Um, but this comes too late. Can the banks really change a lifetime of habits of irresponsible lending? At the end of the day, that's what's made them their profits. So I'm going shopping for some shoes. Mm. Anything else? No. No, you don't want me to buy you anything else? That's unusual. I'll ask you when I get there. Oh, I thought you might. Yeah. You don't think you can carry on to start with, but... You, know, you have to. I have to think of my children. I have to think that they've got the whole life ahead of them. If I'm strong, they'll be strong. I think he, he blamed himself totally. I think he felt he let us down very badly. You know, he loved his family and he loved me and... I think he couldn't find words to say, I've let you down, I've got into all this debt, I've not admitted to. After almost a year and a half of negotiations, RBS settled for a fraction of the remaining £27,000 Mark owed on credit cards and an overdraft. Since then, and after we contacted the bank, the debt has been written off. RBS told us that this was in response to finding out that an earlier offer letter to Mrs McDonald's solicitor was never received. For Marion and her family, these long months of worry have been hard to bear. But it's, uh, it's destroyed my life, destroyed the marriage that we had, destroyed the family life we had. It's all gone. I don't know what you're following them right here. I'm so afraid it isn't actually here. There's nothing we can do about that. If you want to have an interview with somebody, we just try to do it. But what we would appreciate is if you held the cameras mm -hmm. to the ground. Well, Sir Fred Goodwin wasn't there today, neither was any of the other senior executives, apparently. I had a very uh, long conversation with somebody from uh, Group Communications by phone, who's in London, and tells me that she'll try and fix up an interview for me in London tomorrow. So we'll see what we can do. In the meantime, uh, we're being moved on again. Tomorrow came, but no interview. RBS didn't make it happen. Over indebtedness has has become a cancer in British society. It affects every one of us. The banking industry is fully aware of the reasons why people are falling into severe financial difficulty and I felt that not enough was being done about it and in many cases a blind eye was being turned to these issues. I would say that consumers should be very, very wary of their banks. Panorama is making a film about the British water industry and needs your help. If you know of a leak that needs fixing and want to tell us about it or any other water supply issues, please contact our website where you can also comment on tonight's programme. If you've been affected by any of the issues in tonight's programme and would like to talk to someone in confidence, please call the BBC Action Line on 08000 680 661. That's 08000 680 661. The Action Line is open seven days a week from 7.30am until midnight. All calls are free.